This is the last section we'll be dealing with in our introduction to apologetics, metaphysics and epistemology. This section, as well as the faith and reason section, uh, are not actually involved in our argument for Christian apologetics, or are not actually involved uh, in our overall argument to demonstrate the truth of Christianity. But I do think that the subjects are important, uh, and perhaps vital, and even more vital today, uh, that they uh, be known by the apologist. Now, I do not mean to imply by that that you need exposure to this to be able to do apologetics. Uh, but I do think that you need to be exposed to these subjects to fully appreciate why we do apologetics, especially the way we do apologetics today. If you remember in the very beginning with our his history, our survey of the history of apologetics, when we get to the modern period, we have different methods being used for apologetics, different ways of going about doing apologetics. Here I have in mind uh, a strictly uh, evidential approach or a presuppositional approach. Uh, it's here, I think, that, uh, that a number of apologists have gotten away from a correct metaphysical epistemological understanding or gotten away from a correct understanding of faith and reason. Uh, and this has to do with the influence of modern philosophy. Uh, so I think it's here it's important for us to return uh, to these subjects, metaphysics and epistemology, and try to understand them uh, in a correct sense. And by that, I do mean a Aristotelian Thomistic uh, understanding that comes from especially the medieval period. Uh, and I think that an exposure to that will really help to ground us as apologists in a correct method uh, that is able to have as a support or at least a background to our approach, a correct understanding of metaphysics and epistemology. But I also don't want you to think that this introduction I'm giving you to this subject uh, covers everything that needs to be covered for a metaphysic epistemology understanding. There are many important matters that I'm leaving out of the discussion and the coverage. Uh, I'm really focusing on what I think is important to apologetics per se. Uh, I also want you to understand that I probably cannot give for you uh, a great appreciation for the importance of this subject in our brief coverage here. Uh, in fact, in my own experience, it was after uh, taking an undergraduate class in philosophy and then going to seminary uh, and studying a history of philosophy that I really became uh, disenchanted with philosophy uh, for a little bit because I really didn't see uh, much of it as applying to exactly what I wanted to do with respect to metaphysics, or with respect to apologetics. I just didn't see its applicability. But it was after these classes, uh, in another class that I took uh, actually on hermeneutics, that it began to fill in the gaps that existed. And it wasn't until I fully appreciated and understood the Thomistic or the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition uh, that I really saw its application to uh, Christian apologetics. And so uh, there's no way I can give you uh, the history of uh, philosophy or anything like that before this. Uh, but what I was able to experience is that uh, I experienced this desert of philosophy. I didn't see very much in philosophy at all as being important uh, to the Christian faith or to doing apologetics. Uh, and uh, didn't really see it contributing very much at all uh, to my understanding and ability to do those subjects. Uh, but uh Eventually, I did see it, and it took some time uh, to see that and for it to sink in. Uh, so I don't know that I can completely give you the experience where you'll see the relevancy of everything that we cover here. Uh, but I think uh, if you continue to study this subject, the process of apologetic thinking, uh, I think you will see the importance of this. And I also want you to realize, uh, as uh, one of my students uh, evidently did not realize, I teach a, a version of this in, in uh, theological prolegomena. And uh, about a year after I taught a student, he came to me in my office asking me to uh, give him again the argument for uh, the metaphysical understanding that I gave uh, in class. And I had to uh, back up and say uh, that I think that I probably failed if you're asking me to give you an argument for my metaphysic. Uh, while as we go through here, I will give arguments for certain points and aspects. Overall, I'm not able to give you an argument for metaphysics. All we can do, as we'll see, uh, is to observe and reflect and offer an accurate description 
of the way things are in terms of metaphysics. I can't give you an argument like I can in apologetics uh, from premise one uh, all the way through uh, to the end uh, and show you that my metaphysics therefore is true. The only quote unquote, and I use this term usually, uh, loosely, uh, test that I can give you is its comprehensiveness to explain our experience of reality. Uh, and especially to reveal and show uh, certain things that are undeniable uh, to our experience. That's really the best test that I can give you. I can certainly point to the failures of others, uh, but don't take this as an argument. Uh, again, all this is, uh, it, at best, is an observation, reflection, and accurate description uh, of these issues. And I also have to put this in the light of the fact that many today in modern philosophy even shun the notion of doing metaphysics in epistemology. Uh, in fact, there are many differences between the approach that I'm giving you here and what exists in modern philosophy. And so I need to distinguish that from what we're doing here. Even the terms themselves are quite different, so we need to begin uh, with this notion of metaphysics, at least as understood uh, in the medieval period. Metaphysics literally uh, is what the term means. It's beyond the physical, or it's after the physical. physical. I think Joseph Owens was correct uh, when he said that Aristotle truly did order his works in terms of doing that which was physical first, uh, what we would call modern uh, scientific physical understanding. Uh, and then it's after that that he ordered his works such that he should do that, which is after studying physics, uh, which became known as metaphysics. Also, uh, the term ontology uh, might be more accurate to what we're doing here and definitely more medieval. Uh, the study of being or ontos uh, is... Uh, what we really mean by the term metaphysics. It's the study of real being, and it answers questions such as, what is real? Uh, what does it mean to be real? Uh, and we'll deal with this one, is reality one or many? And of course, this all leads to and does involve uh, arguments or answering the question, does God exist? And of course, that's relevant to Christian apologetics. So, in the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, it's the study of being as being, uh, what exists and can exist. And when I say studying being as being, uh, this is the only subject that does that. All other subjects study being as something else. Logic studies mental being, ethics would study moral being, uh, the sciences would study material being, whether it's physics or chemistry or biology. Uh, that might also be referred to as sensible aspects of being. But here in metaphysics, we study being as being, what exists and can exist. And this subject cannot be separated from epistemology. In fact, really to separate them is a modern understanding. In fact, if you open up most uh, modern day uh, textbooks on philosophy, they'll study epistemology first, and then they'll study metaphysics. But that order actually uh, needs to be reversed or is reversed in the medieval sense. It's here that we first study metaphysics uh, and involved in metaphysics, uh, we answer questions related to epistemology. And of course, this deals with uh, questions related to the intellect and how the intellect knows. But it's important to understand that you can't distinguish these subjects from one another. Uh, to answer an epistemological issue or question involves or presupposes a metaphysical understanding or an understanding of being. Uh, so in the medieval sense, this actually would be referred to as psychology. Uh, that is, epistemology would be understood as really the study of the soul. Now, I don't even mean psychology here in the modern sense of the, under, uh, of the understanding. In the medieval sense, it's the study of souk, uh, which is Greek for soul, or anima, which is Latin for soul. Uh, so that's what we mean by psychology. Uh, it's here in epistemology uh, that you study uh, knowing things, and of course, that is the study of the soul. It answers questions such as what is knowledge, what does it mean to know, and deals with issues of truth. And of course, there we get into the issue of apologetics. 
So in the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, it's really the study of the soul, or we might say the intellect, the will, uh, and many other capacities that could be listed there as well. But again, I think it's important to emphasize that epistemological questions cannot be answered apart from metaphysical, from a metaphysical understanding. So to start with, well, let's deal with a very ancient, very old problem concerning what is reality, and that's really the problem of monism, and it's Parmenides that gave us the real challenge uh, to uh, the issue of what is reality by proposing and ar actually arguing uh, that everything must be one, must be monistic. Uh, now, this is relevant to Christian apologetics because here he's arguing for at least a version of pantheism uh, versus theism. And of course, if he's right, then our uh, approach to apologetics uh, is completely altered. Uh, if monism is true, uh, then how are we going to uh, establish theism? Uh, so here there is some relevancy to apologetics, uh, but it's also, as we'll see, really an argument against change, which is very philosophical. One thing that the early Greek philosophers had a very difficult time with uh, was dealing with the issue or the problem of change. Uh, is it real? Uh, or is it not real? And how do you uh, deal with that particular problem? How can something be the same and yet also change over time? So here's his argument. He said, only one thing is in the universe, because if there were many, they would have to differ, uh, or we could say they would have to change. But he says that there's only two ways to differ, by being something or else by being nothing. But you can't differ by nothing because to differ by nothing is really not to differ at all. And you can't differ by something because being is the only thing which makes them identical, that is, which they have in common. Therefore, Parmenides concluded, there are no differences and no two beings, only one being in the universe, and hence monism is true. So he's saying uh, in short here, or in brief, you can't have two things, because to have two things, and understand that when he says two things, he's talking about things in a metaphysical sense. You can't have two things, because in order to have two things, they would have to differ. But the only way that they can differ is by being or non-being. But you can't differ by being and non-being because obviously non-being is the same thing as nothing. So hence, everything must ultimately be the same according to his argument. If being is the only thing that things have in common, then they must all be one and can't really be different from one another. Well, there were many reactions to this argument. Uh, but they can be grouped into two categories. One is that there were those who have said, uh, there were differences in non-being. The atomists uh, uh, argued this way, and so did Plato argue this way as well. And then were, there were those that said that you could differ in terms of being. And this is where Aristotle comes in. Uh, Aristotle, on the overall uh, reaction to Parmenides, just tended to dismiss uh, his argument since it seemed to be so contrary to common sense. Uh, things, when you look at them, of course, look very different. How can you say they're all one thing? Uh, so uh, he really never made an a, asserted effort to directly respond to him, but he also really didn't have in his philosophy the equipment that was necessary to respond to Parmenides. Uh, we'll explain this later, but Aristotle never makes a distinction between essay and existence. Uh, he makes no distinctions between essence uh, and existence, and therefore he really didn't have in his uh philosophical pocket, so to speak, the right tools to give a cogent and clear answer and response. And it isn't until Thomas Aquinas comes along in the medieval period that we really get a full uh, philosophical answer and rigorous uh, response to Parmenides that clearly shows him to be flawed in his approach uh, to dealing with the problem of change. Aquinas answered in the category that there is differences or difference uh, in being. He says that being is complex, 
And the problem with other solutions that are proposed by various philosophers to Parmenides' challenge is that they are built on a univocal, and that this term means exactly the same thing in terms of a meaning of being when they should be built on an analogous or similar meaning of being. In other words, what he's doing here very subtly is he's responding uh, to Parmenides in terms of saying that he has a wrong understanding of being. Uh, and it's here that his distinction between essence and existence becomes extremely important. Because he's going to say that existence deals with that something is, and its essence deals with what something is. And this distinction becomes extremely important, not only in terms of responding to Parmenides and giving Aquinas uh, the tools that are necessary to actually explain reality itself in terms of an understanding, metaphysical understanding. He says that essence is what something is, and this is different than its existence that something is. Fully understand and appreciate Aquinas' response here to Parmenides, uh, we have to understand how Aquinas is using some of his terms. Uh, and also, let me give you an illustration uh, in just a little bit that I think will help you understand his response and how forceful uh, of a uh, response it is to Parmenides' problem. So let's start with the topic of being itself. Uh, how is Aquinas using the term being? And in metaphysics, being as being, as we've mentioned before, uh, rather than some particular kind of being as in other subjects. It's also the most comprehensive concept applying to everything that exists or can exist. And also needs to be thought of, and I use this term usually, uh, very loosely, because even to form a concept of being, uh, including certain things, because it's the most comprehensive concept possible, uh, is really something that's somewhat elusive. Uh, even the concept of existence or being is not exactly possible in the strictest sense. Because once you formulate a concept of existence or being, uh, that itself has existence or being uh, with respect to it. And so how can something that you formulate a concept for that is the exact same thing you're formulating a concept for explain itself? Uh, so it's something that's actually quite elusive. And this is, uh, have been, is quite problematic to a number of philosophers. Uh, but I think it's best to be understood in terms not of a noun or even a concept, but as a verb. Uh, it's not what things are, but what things do. And it's the most general category or classification that could be identified for things. There's nothing more general than being. Uh, you can take a look at uh, another classification, maybe, for example, animal, uh, which can be divided into vertebrates and invertebrates. But the classification or the category of animal is neither vertebrate nor invertebrate. And, of course, it can't be both. But you can take animal and add it to other uh, broader uh, concepts, such as in the category of living beings, uh, but it's not the case with being itself, since you cannot add anything to being as though it were something to be uh, included, something uh, such as though it, there was something that could not be included under it. Uh, everything can be included under it. Uh, and there are different aspects of being that we'll talk about in just a little bit, such as act and potency, form, matter, essence, and existence. And these are all different aspects of being. But as Aquinas says, nothing can be added to being as though it were something not included in being in the way that as differences is added to a genus or an accident to a subject. Uh, for every reality is essentially a being. So with this understanding, let me give you an illustration that I think will lead to uh, a fuller appreciation for the metaphysics that he's established here in its response to Parmenides's. Consider a tree. Let's use this as an illustration. Pretend that we take a trip to our nearest forest uh, and we all stand around looking at a tree. 
Uh, there are certain things that you would uh, be able to immediately answer without thinking, without much thought, uh, because of our experience in age and growing uh, that we've been able to experience concerning our intellect. We answer these questions very quickly about it. But nonetheless, if we were new to this, uh, such as an infant would be or a small child would be, we would immediately uh, answer at least uh, three questions about uh, the tree. Uh, the first two being very easy uh, and related to the issue of existence and essence. First of all, we would ask whether it is, and of course we would answer, of course it is. It's a tree, it exists right in front of us, it's standing right there. Uh, it is evident to us that it exists, uh, and if we haven't been exposed to modern philosophy, of course uh, we could answer that it exists. The second thing is, what is it? And of course, this is related to its essence. And of course, we immediately answer because of our prior experience uh, of putting uh, things like this into a similar category. We answer that it's a tree. Now, the third question is quite uh, difficult, uh, and we may not exactly know the answer to the third question, but it's nonetheless important. And that is, why is it? What caused the tree? But before we get to uh, this third question and third issue that I think is so important, let's first identify some aspects of being with respect to the tree that we're standing and looking at. Uh, first of all, there are certain aspects of its being. It's very solid. Uh, it has certain colors. It's a certain height. Uh, there are many things that we can, uh, what we would call uh, characteristics or accidental qualities uh, about the tree uh, that we could certainly identify. Uh, we'd also look around and we would see many things that it's not in terms of its being. It's not the rocks that are on the ground or the sticks or the cat that's nearby. Uh, it's not any of those things. And probably after we get through uh, recognizing all those things that it is and uh, recognize many things that it's not, probably the most obvious and noticeable characteristic of the thing uh, after its existence and its essence is the fact that it changes. It becomes other than something was. Now, there are many kinds of changes that it can go uh, through. Uh, it can uh, certainly have what we might refer to as uh, natural changes uh, according to what it is, such as it's able to grow to a certain height. Uh, it's able to change colors throughout the season. Sometimes it has leaves and sometimes it doesn't have leaves. Um, it grows uh, larger in terms of the trunk of the tree as well as time goes on. So there are lots of changes that seem natural to it. We also can notice that we can also uh, cause such things that we might refer to as external changes. Uh, we can uh, break limbs off of the tree such that it doesn't have them anymore. Uh, we could also uh, destroy the tree. We could completely cut it down, uh, turn it into something else or make it into something else. And hence, we would say, well, uh, we've taken it apart, but it's no longer fitting the classification of a tree. All of this would indicate that it can undergo various types of changes. But there's also something remarkable about it as we sit there and observe it. Even though it undergoes a number of natural changes, uh, that if we stood there long enough, we could detect uh, that these changes are quite uh, drastic. Uh, as the tree grows over time, it grows to a large height. Um, but there's something interesting about it, and we'll come back to this observation later on. But one of the things that we can do is we can see that this tree is not the same as the other trees. And in other words, uh, while we can look at many trees in our forest, uh, we can certainly identify this tree versus that tree. And not only in terms of making distinction between other trees, but even though this tree grows and goes through a number of changes, it stays the same tree that we can still identify. We'll return to these observations later. But at this point, we've made enough observations to notice that it undergoes certain change. And I think that reason would tell us that whatever principle that accounts for the sameness uh, in a tree must be a different a principle that accounts for the changes in a tree or in a thing. If this is so, then it entails that any changing thing 
has to be composed. In other words, change must be accounted for by principles that are rooted in the thing's nature as it exists. Aquinas gave two terms to describe this notion of change, and that is act and potency, or actuality and potentiality. And this motion or change is the actuality of being in potency. And potency uh, is something uh, that cannot give rise to itself. Uh, it must already be an act. We've already identified in our observation that there's some change that is just natural to the thing itself, that's rooted uh, in the thing itself. But there's other change that can take place with respect to it uh, that is not rooted in itself, uh, change that would be external or from an external source. And it's this type of change that it can undergo, that is uh, what we would refer to as a substantial change, change that would make the tree not exist anymore, that forces us in our observation to conclude that the tree cannot be the cause of its own existence. Now, again, the change we're identifying here is substantial change. It can go out of existence. I can turn it into a heap of sawdust if I wanted to, uh, and it would no longer exist anymore. The form would completely change uh, and no longer be a tree. It's not the kind of change we're talking about here that enables it to move uh, in and of itself. That is one part moving another part. Now, this may be harder to see in a tree, but if we take a cat, for example, that would walk across the floor. We're not dealing with the issue of change related of movement of one part by another part, uh, such as in an animal or a cat, uh, flexing its leg muscles and causing uh, them to be moved. But here we're dealing with in terms of the change that can take it completely out of existence, uh, a change that can take place uh, that it does not have the actuality to do on its own but is imparted to it by an outside source. And if it can go out of existence, then it cannot account for itself coming into existence. And so that leads us to the third and the last question. What is its cause or why uh, is it there versus not there? And to its cause, we only have three logical options. Uh, we can say that it's self-caused, but of course, this one we can immediately cross off the list because self-causation or causa sui is impossible. Two, we could say that it's uncaused, but of course, that we need to cross off the list because we already know it exists. Uh, so uh, it can't be uncaused, and that leads us to the only third possible option, and that is that it's caused by another. And we might say, uh, or might think, that what causes it is something else that can ultimately undergo cause or undergo change, uh, but we would find ourselves put into a position where we could not go on forever and ever and ever with respect to this issue. This is called an infinite regress. And an infinite regress is ultimately impossible. As you well know from having studied apologetics, you can't have an infinite regress because if you had an infinite regress, if we could think of one, we would have to identify something in the infinite regress that is not only causing something else to exist, but also causing itself to exist. Uh, and that's impossible. Uh, so you must ultimately account for things that can change in terms of them going into existence and out of existence by something that always exists. And of course, you can see how this leads ultimately uh, to this notion of something that must exist that doesn't have the potentiality not to exist. Now, again, Aquinas' terms for everything that is composed that can change, as I've identified it here, as being act and potency. That is, it's composed. These are principles in being itself. 
They're not something that are cre- that is created by our mind. Later scholastics uh, attach to these act and potency principles to our mind and our thinking. Uh, but Aquinas held that they were actually principles in being in terms uh, of actuality and potentiality. And anything that is actuality and potentiality cannot account for its own existence. And therefore, because you cannot have an infinite regress, you amount, you must account for the existence of anything that exists that is composed of act and potency by something that is not composed of act and potency or is pure actuality. And of course, this is going to identify ultimately as God and be able to use this act potency distinction in his argumentation for the existence of God. Of course, we've done that in apologetics. But here again, we're just thinking metaphysically about, in this case, a tree. So because you cannot have an infinite regress, you must have something that is pure act. You must have one thing in which its essence and its existence are identical to each other. While everything else its essence and existence related to its act and potency is simply composed and cannot account for its own existence, but must be accounted for by something that exists which is not act and potency, but is pure act. And of course, pure potency is not an option for us. Uh, that is, pure potency with no act is, is impossible. You can't have change or you can't have the potency potential to change without having actuality. Now, of course, this leads to another observation with regards to act and potency. But before we get to that, uh, let me show you the powerful answer this has in terms of responding to Parmenides, is which problem, uh, which is where we started. Remember that Parmenides said uh, that being is the same, and the only way for being to differ is to either to exist or not exist. But of course, to not exist is not to be, so there's really no difference at all. Therefore, everything's one. Well, Parmenides is incorrect because you have to account for being uh, in terms of change, and that has to be identified as principles that are in things in order to account for that change. And of course, if something changes, that is, it can go into existence or out of existence, then you can only do that by accounting for something that is pure act. And hence, it's here that we get our two different kinds of being. One being is pure actuality. All other being has being from that which is pure act, which is composed of act and potency. Parmenides does not have the correct understanding of being, uh, because as Aquinas would say, being here is understood in an analogical sense, uh, or a similar sense. That which has act and potency has being in a similar sense to that which is pure act, but not in a univocal or identical sense. But it's here we want to move to another very important observation, and that is the notion of this act and potency can also be attached to form and matter, that is, a substance that exists, that is composed in terms of act and potency, uh, also must be composed of form and matter, a form being related to its act or actuality in terms of what it is uh, or its essence, and potency being related to matter in terms of its ability to change or undergo change. Thomas Aquinas says that now in a material thing, there is a twofold composition. First, there is the composition of form with matter, and to this corresponds what that composition of the intellect, whereby the universal whole is predicated of its part. For the genus is derived from common matter, while the differences that completes the species is derived from the form and the particular form individual matter. Now, uh, here, let me uh, explain it in somewhat simpler, uh, easier terms to understand than what he's saying here. But let me distinguish what form is not. Do not think in terms of form as related to the shape of something. Uh, And also, you should not think of matter as being something related to its material sense or uh, what uh, modern science would term 
uh, atoms or subatomic particles. Remember, this is after the study of physics. This is metaphysics. So here, these terms are not related to the shape of something or the matter of something, at least in the scientific sense. Instead, form needs to be understood uh, as the essence of something. Uh, that is what something is. Uh, these are principles that describe finite uh, objects or substances in reality. And the form is the kind of a thing that is. That is, for example, a cat. And the matter is the individuation of the thing that is. That is, this cat or that cat. And to distinguish the matter, sometimes um, uh, first matter uh, would be understood in the sense that I'm using it here as the principle of individuation. In other words, here, when I use the term matter, I'm not talking about secondary matter or second matter, which is what science would study. But when I use it in terms of first matter, I'm talking about where and how the particles are arranged with respect to the form that enable, when I am able to look at a cat, I see that this cat is not the same as that cat, even though they have the same Form. Now, I'll return to this observation uh, a, a little bit later on and make some very, very important conclusions regarding it in terms of how we know, uh, but uh, this is at least enough to settle the issue with regards to uh, some important terms. And so let me give you uh, some of these definitions because I've used them and I want to formally define them for you. Uh, first of all, uh, essence that I've used is what a thing is. It's a definable substance. In material things, at least, it is always composed of form and matter. And only together do these things, does, do uh, form and matter constitute uh, a substance in terms of a thing as I'm using it here, in terms of our everyday experience of uh, composed substances form and matter have to be together in order for it to constitute something uh, in sensible reality. And of course, existence is the act by which essence, a substance, has being. And this, of course, in composed things of form and matter, uh, has to be given to it by something else that is pure act. And of course, act is that which already is, that which has existence or is existence. And potency is that which can be but is not. That is the actuality of a being in potentiality. Uh, according to its nature, it has the potency or potentiality to become other than what it is right now. And of course, I've used the term substance, and by this I mean a corporeal things uh, composed of form and matter. And here again, I think it's important to realize that matter is not being used in the scientific sense, what we might call secondary matter. But this is first matter. This again is the principle of individuation or a quantifier. Uh, this is the principle that tells the secondary matter or the secondary matter that science discovers where to be that is able to... Uh, allow me to individuate one thing from another thing, to distinguish between this cat and that cat, even though both cats have the same form. And of course, form is the principle or activity, or the principle of act or of activity. That is what it is. Now, we'll return to these uh, much later, uh, and when we get to uh, the issue of uh, answering the question of how do we know. Well, let me just review uh, briefly after looking at these terms what uh, Aquinas has been able to do. He's taken us out and we've been able to make an observation of a tree. And from those observations of a tree, we've been able to really uh, label things concerning metaphysics uh, that must be true in order to account for change in something. And because something exists that can undergo a substantial change, that is, go out of existence or come into existence, it cannot account for its own existence. In order to account for that, because of infinite regress is impossible, you must therefore account uh, for it in terms of something that does not change, that can't go out of existence or come into existence. And this, of course, must be something that is in pure act or is pure actuality or pure existence. So here, from just looking at something that's composed and able to change, 
you're able to get to something that is not composed, that is not able to change. It's this undergirding, these observations of reality that undergird uh, his ability to make argumentation, formal argumentation, uh, towards uh, the existence of God based on first principles that we do in Christian apologetics. But then we come to those who become very skeptical uh, about Christian uh, apologetics or arguments for the existence of God, and many would hold today uh, that starting with Rene Descartes and modern philosophy, uh, philosophers have dealt a death blow to any argumentation for the existence of God. And of course, starting with Rene Descartes uh, is the birth of modern philosophy. And if you recall that Descartes, uh, or Descartes excuse me, uh, was a French mathematician uh, who was quite impressed with the certitude he was able to achieve in mathematics. And he wanted to take that same certitude that he found in mathematics and apply it to issues in philosophy. And ultimately, and admittedly, uh, he wanted to prove that Christianity was true. So he uh, took the same level of certitude that he saw in mathematics and attempted to achieve it in philosophy. The problem is, is that all philosophers have recognized, all modern philosophers have recognized that he failed miserably uh, to do it. Uh, he uh, wanted to argue for the existence of a real, knowable, external world and found that he failed to do it. Uh, then when he failed to do that, he decided to argue for the existence of God in hopes that he could get to that real, knowable, external world. And all pretty much have recognized uh, that he failed uh, there as well, either to get to God uh, or to then get to the real, external, knowable world. And about 150 years later, Immanuel Kant comes along. Immanuel Kant is not interested in saving Christianity or even uh, proving the existence of God. He is much more interested in saving the, the uh, sciences or science itself from the skepticism of David Hume. Because David Hume has come along and said that causation is not something we are always able to know. Uh, it's something that we must assume. And so Kant sets out ultimately to save science. And in the process of saying, saving science, uh, he comes to the understanding that metaphysics, uh, as traditionally understood, is not a subject that is possible in getting to or achieving its ends or its goals. He studied uh, his metaphysics under Christian Wolff, who took his metaphysical understanding from uh, Leibniz. And Kant's conclusion is that metaphysics is impossible, and along with that go the arguments for the existence of God. There he argues that arguing for the existence of God is not possible because the arguments themselves are all based on or rely upon the invalid ontological argument. But what I'd like to demonstrate or show to you uh, as I've stated before, the starting point for René Descartes and the starting point for the medieval theologians is quite different, especially the starting point for Thomas Aquinas and his uh, argumentation. René Descartes began with, I think, therefore I am. Uh, for Kant, uh, he began with, I think. Uh, but both of these starting points start with thought. The medieval starting point is with being. In other words, it starts with something exists or being exists. The other starting points, Descartes included, uh, insist that philosophy must begin in and from the mind and then proceed to things concerning the external world. The medieval starting point completely negates this, denies it. We start with a knowable external world in terms of its being and the broadest concept that can be created in order to describe that which is. Mortimer Adler, uh, in a quote, describes uh, what's going on here. He says this, It's not until Descartes in the 17th century did any philosopher engage in an experiment of doubt that required him to argue for the existence of the external physical world. Doubting the evidence presented by his senses, Descartes, too, 
took refuge in what appeared to him an undeniable truth. His doubting involved his thinking, and if he was thinking, he could not avoid the conclusion that a thinking being existed. However, his cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, did not establish the existence of Descartes the human individual, body and mind, but only the existence of his intellect, the agency of his doubting and thinking. From that conclusion, he developed a highly questionable argument for the existence of God. And it is this highly questionable argument that most are going to look back on and think that it is the same as all the other arguments that have ever been given throughout time, not really realizing that it is quite a different starting point than that of Thomas Aquinas and the medieval approach and metaphysic that existed there. And for Kant, it gets even worse. The solution that he proposes to the Humean problem of cause and effect uh, is actually worse than the supposed disease uh, that, that Hume had uh, suspected existed. Here, Kant has to make a gap or a gulf that exists uh, between the mind and the knower and the real world itself. Uh, you have on one side the external uh, world, the thing in itself, or the object in reality, a huge gulf that exists in the middle. And then on the other side, you have the mind uh, and the object uh, as it is presented to the knower. Uh, here, because of this gulf, one may never get to the thing as it is in itself. Now, Immanuel Kant, uh, coming from a Mortimer Adler, says, uh, did not deny a reality independent of the mind. But that reality, the ding and such, the things in themselves, he also declared completely unknowable. The realm of objective and public experience that is knowable by us is shaped and determined in its characteristics by the innate structure of the human mind. So here he takes all that we know, all that we perceive, and gives it a subjective reality uh, in terms of the person and their experience. Uh, you can see how this can be taken to a, an extreme of relativism. Kant didn't take it there, but taking this to an extreme of relativism and all subjects of study leads to our postmodern mindset. Now, he never took it to this extreme, but someone certainly could in our society and culture definitely has. There were two reactions to Immanuel Kant's position. Uh, one was referred to as critical realism. Critical realism took Kant as the starting point, saying that there is a gulf that exists, but simply believed uh, that it was actually able to be bridged, that a bridge could be built over the gulf and we could get to the thing in itself. Some apologists, admittedly, both Catholic and Protestant, have taken this route, uh, thinking that they can build a bridge over the Kantian gulf that exists and get to the thing itself and actually understand it, showing that Kant was wrong. We could get over the gulf. Uh, some have started uh, this process and then believed it was not possible. So if you start this process and believe it's not possible, then you end up with the second reaction, which is idealism. That is to stay uh, where we are with respect to the mind, uh, recognizing that we cannot get to the thing in any objective sense in terms of reality. So we just live with what we can know, what we can investigate, and that is the mind itself. And this is where Kant left us. This is really where he left the sciences. This was his solution, is to study and to know uh, the phenomena, which is, the, which is what is in the mind uh, alone, and to forget about the real external knowable world, uh, unknowable world, or, or the noumena, uh, the thing in itself, uh, which we just cannot know. But I'd like to suggest as we move along uh, and get to the issue of the intellect, uh, Kant and the modern philosophy uh, really has no appreciation or concept uh, for Thomas Aquinas, his understanding of the intellect, uh, and even his approach to arguing or establishing the existence of God and his metaphysic that exists. Another way to look at this is we have to recognize the fact that philosophy just cannot establish some things. There's just some things philosophy cannot and never can do. And one of the things it can never do is argue for the existence of an external knowable world. 
if the external knowable world can't convince you that it exists, an argument for the external knowable world will fare no better. In other words, if the brick wall, as my metaphysic professor put it, if the brick wall cannot convince you that it is real, uh, what makes any of us think that a philosophical argument about the brick wall will be any more convincing. As Mortimer Adler says in his book, Intellect, Mind Over Matter, does the conceived object really exist is a question that should never be asked about a validly perceived or remembered object. Yet in modern philosophy, and only in modern philosophy, it has been asked persistently in antiquity and in the Middle Ages. No philosopher ever asked for a proof or anything like a proof for the reality of the external world for the reality of the past, or for the reality of other minds. This is just something that philosophy cannot do. That's why beginning with being, which is undeniable in terms of a first principle, is a sufficient place to begin in terms of arguing for certain things. And of course, if an argument can be reduced to that which is a first principle, then it's demonstratively true. Now we turn to epistemology in the issue or the question of how do we know, but it's here that we must recall and take from our metaphysic. If you remember in our example of the tree, uh, it, it was there that we made the distinction between uh, essence and existence. Uh, and we also made uh, and identified each of those with respect to act and potency, and also there made a further distinction with regards to form and matter. For example, these distinctions we made at this level of form and matter are referred to as the hylomorphic understanding of reality. And it works this way, as we've already explained, and let me review. Uh, a cat has the form of catness, and dog has the form of dogness. The matter uh, is related to the individuality or the potentiality to change. It is that which individuates in essence to be this cat or that cat, this dog or that dog. And again, I've identified this as first matter, not that which science studies, which is called second matter. As used here, it should not be equated with physical matter or second matter. And the form, as I mentioned before, should not be equated with the shape of something. Instead, these are real distinct principles of finite substances in reality, composed substances in reality. The form of a substance is immaterial. The matter of a substance is that which individuates the essence to be a particular thing. That is, it gives it extension in space, which is limited, of course, to the form or the nature, the essence of the thing. We can say a dog is not a cat because of their different form or essence. We can say this cat is not that cat because of their different matter. The way in which we know something is by its form, which is united to matter. And then, of course, we know a substance via our five senses. But this whole issue... Uh, we need to bring into this question is the medieval understanding of soul. Uh, because again, uh, this is really the notion of psychology or souks or the study of the soul. To ask how do we know something? How do we know the form matter composition or the hylomorphic understanding of reality? Well, will only be able to be answered if we have a correct uh, understandable concept of the soul itself. Of course, the soul is what makes something a living thing. And in hylomorphism, it's important to understand uh, that the form alone is the substance. As Aquinas put it, the soul is the first principle of life and those things which live. And in Aquinas' thinking, he identified uh, at least three hierarchies of soul, vegetative, animal, and rational. Uh, for example, in our hylomorphic understanding, uh, a rock would not be considered living, would not have a soul. But nonetheless, it still has a hylomorphic uh, composition. Uh, that, is, that is, it still has a form, matter, substance composition. And it's the form, matter, composition together that constitutes the act or actuality of a substance in terms of it existing. And so while the rock is not living, it is still, again, a form-matter composition. 
But after that, you do have vegetative souls or plant souls uh, in which the order exists that the nature of something, the plant is ordered by nature towards uh, taking in nutrients, uh, growing, uh, reproducing itself. Uh, this is referred to as a vegetative soul. Uh, it is completely uh, dependent upon matter uh, and its form matter composition uh, for its existence. And once that's destroyed, uh, then the plant, of course, is destroyed as well. And then you have animal souls, sometimes referred to as uh, sensory souls. Uh, here you have uh, the powers of sensa sensation, uh, the powers of locomotion, uh, able to move itself, an appetite soul. Uh, an animal soul. Uh, again, this one also is completely dependent upon matter. But understand that a human soul, or what is referred to as a rational soul, or sometimes an intellective soul, is really of a different nature than all of these, animal and vegetable uh, included. The rational soul, or intellective soul, is not different just in terms of degree, but actually in terms of kind. Because the rational soul uh, has all that the plant and animal soul is able to be or able to do, uh, grow nutrients, uh, uh, powers of sensation, locomotion, and appetite, sensory uh, faculties, and so forth, has all of that. But it has something that makes it of a different kind or a different nature, because it's here that only the rational soul has the intellect and will. The other souls do not have that. And I'll flesh out what I mean by intellect and will in just a little bit in terms of the powers uh, of those capacities or those aspects of being. But it is some, and at least uh, some have put forth uh, the notion or at least asked the question, uh, does a computer have a soul? And a strict understanding, the answer to that that Aquinas would give is no. Uh, complex machines may give the appearance that they move themselves, but they have no soul. They're actually not even a substance, but really what they are uh, is an artifact, which is a composite of different substances uh, with no inherent tendency to come together uh, and function uh, as themselves except what is intended or put into it by the creator or the maker. So just as a side note, uh, computers do not have souls. Key to understanding the superiority of the human soul, that it is not just different in terms of degree, but different in kind, uh, is to understand its natural end or its final cause uh, of the intellect is to grasp abstract concepts and to reason, and on the basis of those, uh, to ultimately obtain to truth. And the natural end of the will is to choose the best course of action with respect to the truth that it's discovered. Uh, by the intellect. The highest fulfillment of the human intellect is ultimately to know God, uh, since the highest fulfillment of the will is to freely choose uh, to live in such a way as to facilitate the knowing of God. Uh, this is something that is not achievable by plants and animals, and this makes the human soul or the human intellect of a different kind and a different nature than that which is contained in plants and animals. The intellect is not sense cognition, which is limited to seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling. Uh, the intellect can do much more. The intellect knows incorporeal things, such as wisdom, uh, truth, uh, relationships between things, and abstractions. Now, it is true that our sensations that we have of things do give rise to imagination. Thomas Aquinas had a word for this, which was phantasm. Uh, our imagination or the image that you can create in your mind of something or imagination, he referred to as a phantasm. And a phantasm is always something that is particular or individual. It's not something that is universal, as we'll see. Uh, phantasms are mental images. You can have a mental image of a triangle, but this mental image of a triangle is different than what you're also able to create, which is a concept of the triangle. And all of this, of course, takes place in our active uh, intellect, but it's here that from the uh, phantasm and the sensory input of the object, 
as it is uh, in reality, that we create a concept. And the concept oftentimes is much clearer than the image that we can create. The image can be vague, it can be uh, distorted, it can be indistinct, but the concepts are usually much more definite, much more clear. Uh, for example, it's almost impossible to picture a chilagon, which is a 1,000-sided figure. Uh, at least you can't do that and make a distinction between a 999-sided figure. That's almost impossible to do that in terms of an image. But you can create two different concepts, as I just gave you the definition of a chil chilagon, which is a 1,000-sided figure, uh, and you were able to distinguish that concept from a figure that has 999 sides. And it's also worth recognizing that there are some things that have no mental images. We experience economics, uh, the law, uh, and even love, and do not have mental images of those things. But we do know what they are. Uh, the intellect uh, can uh, create concepts of those things and definitions of those things. So it's here that it's worth recognizing what many in modern philosophy have not recognized is that you cannot reduce the intellect to sensation or imagination. It is able to do, as we'll see, much more than that. And it's also worth pointing out, uh, as we'll see, that in perception of these things, it is the objects themselves that we were able to perceive and that the mind is ultimately able to grasp. It's not representations or copies of those things. But what happens when we remove the thing itself, when we don't have the immediate thing, I'm still able to create a phantasm or an image of the thing itself. Even though I'm not directly looking at a cat, I can create an image of a cat in my mind. And the reason I'm able to do that is because of the passive intellect. And sensation, uh, using our senses, involves the perception of individual things which give rise to the images or the phantasms of the imagination and the memory. But by the visual perception, uh, you have a cat, for example, I'm able to later recall that cat uh, when the cat's not there and create a mental image of the cat. I can create even what the cat looks like or looked like when I saw it. I'm also able to do other things that are quite remarkable. Uh, in my imagination, uh, I'm able to produce images of cats that I've never actually seen before. I can even create caricatures uh, of cats, rearrange the elements through my mental processes. Of course, this is all based on things that I have seen, but nonetheless, I can put them together, and this truly is a remarkable power. But I'm able to do that because I can create from my phantasm, which is directly linked, of course, to the thing in reality, what is referred to as a universal. I'm able to strip away all that is particular or individualized about the cat and create a truly universal concept of catness. Now, this is referred to in metaphysics, to mystic metaphysics, as an intelligible species. That is, I'm able to create that which is universal or common to all cats. As Aquinas says, the active intellect causes the phantasms received from the senses to be actually intelligible by a process of abstraction. But it's here to note, uh, as we'll point out uh, later, that this notion of catness or this universal that I'm able to abstract uh, from the phantasm or from my experience of the thing in reality is a universal that stops here in the mind, and hence this is known as moderate realism and should be distinguished from other kinds of realism. When the intellect understands something, uh, it grasps its form, or the form of the thing. The form exists in the intellect and in the thing itself, that is, its essence. When you understand what a triangle is, the form of triangularity, which exists in the actual triangle, now exists also in your intellect. When you understand what a cat is, the form of catness, which exists in actual cats, now exists also in the intellect. So to understand anything or to know anything, 
is to have the form come to exist in the mind, which remember, the form is immaterial. This is extremely important because this is how we know the thing as it is in itself or the thing in reality, because there ultimately are not two things that I know. There's not this uh, external world thing and this subjective representation thing. If that were the case, then I've got a Kantian gap that exists. Uh, this would give rise to uh, or raise questions as to how one gets uh, the thing uh, or knows the thing as it is in itself. So it's important to understand that there is just one thing uh, that is a form which exists in two ways. Uh, one way is an intentive existence, that is, Something is in the form is instantiated in matter to comprise of material uh, objects, and it also exists in an intentional way, that is, in the intellect itself. So the form of a substance is immaterial. Uh, because it's immaterial, it is able to enter our mind, and we are able to know the substance as it is in itself. It is very important to understand that the form which enters the mind is not a different substance or a copy of the substance that comes to exist in the mind of the knower. It is the same form that is united with matter that unites with our mind with the mind of the knower. So in a sense, the knower and the thing known become one. That being the case, there is no Kantian gap or existence. That being the case, there is no Kantian gap that exists uh, when our intellect is properly understood. Much of modern philosophy tries to reduce our thoughts, our sensations, mental images to words and pictures and representations. And this is because they have a, a, a materialistic uh, worldview and uh, not a hylomorphic understanding of reality. But the hylomorphic understanding of reality uh, gives rise to the possibility of understanding things because they are a form matter composite. I am able to know the very essence of things because the form uh, and the mind are able to unite and literally to become one. Now, this is not something that is investigatable by scientific processes. This is completely metaphysical or immaterial. It is not the matter that enters my mind, but it's the form that enters the mind. And hence, this is immaterial or metaphysical. And there's nothing for uh, the physical sciences to actually study here. Now, there is a philosophical problem we need to pause and deal with, and that is the problem of universals themselves. I've kind of given you the Thomistic understanding, and uh, in that sense, left the... Uh, let the cat out of the bag as to what the correct understanding of universals is. But it's important at this point to at least react and acknowledge some of the other uh, philosophical positions with respect to universals. Uh, the first one is absolute realism, which says that universals exist in themselves. This was Plato's view. If you remember uh, the cave analogy in uh, Plato's Republic, uh, Book 7, where someone was in a cave, uh, sat bound, uh, only looking in one direction, and behind them was a great light. All they saw on the cave wall were the shadows of things. Uh, this was Plato's view that basically said that all we see in this world are the shadows of things, and the real forms, or the perfect forms, of things are somewhere else. Uh, now, he uh, didn't say uh, where they were, uh, but nonetheless, he said uh, the things in this world only participate in some way in those forms or in those perfect forms that exist. Now, he never told us how they participated in them, and he never told us where the forms were, but this is referred to as absolute uh, realism. Then there's Immanuel Kant's view, which is conceptual uh, re uh, realism or conceptualism that says universals exist as categories in the mind only. Obviously, in his view, he can't put them also in things uh, because we can't know things as they are in themselves. Uh, so for him, uh, conceptualism uh, is the only route to go which puts them in the mind and the mind alone. 
And then, of course, there's the view of nominalism. Nominalism says that there are no universals at all. Occam uh, held to this view. Uh, but this view says that there are no essences in things. Uh, things just have names that we give them and agree upon. Uh, so there really are no knowable essences uh, in any sense of the term with respect to nominalism. But as I pointed out before, it's really only moderate realism that gives us the correct understanding. Moderate realism says that universals are grounded in reality by forms and can come to exist in the mind, but their existence stops there, hence the term moderate. And this was Aristotle's view and Aquinas' view. Now, the other views... Absolute realism and conceptualism, the first two views we looked at, uh, create a gap that exists uh, in the mind, uh, between the mind of the knower and the thing as it is in reality. Uh, and hence, uh, there's no way to show uh, that we truly know the thing in itself. And so this would lead to skepticism, which must be rejected. And nominalism is just not very explanatory. Uh, if nominalism is true, only names or particulars exist, then how can we account for our ability to classify and identify uh, things in terms of universals uh, and even speak of particular things uh, being in the same classes with one another, for example, all that fit the classification of a tree or a cat or so forth. Hence, uh, the classification cannot be embodied in the matter of the particular. It must be something that is immaterial or universal that we're able to obtain this level of classification. And so I think it's from here that we can move uh, to actually make an argument uh, for the immateriality of human beings, or at least the intellect. Uh, universals uh, must be immaterial. Uh, for example, only Argument can go this way. Only individual things exist materially. Universals exist as concepts or classes of things. Therefore, universals must be immaterial. As Mortimer Adler says, whatever exists physically exists as an individual, and whatever has individuality exists materially. No one has ever experienced or produced anything that has physical or corporeal existence, and also is a universal in character rather than an individual. Our concepts are universal in their significance. Our concepts are universal in their signification of objects that are kinds or classes of things rather than individuals that are particular instances of these classes or kinds. Since they have universality, they cannot physically exist physically or be embodied in matter. But concepts do exist in our mind, hence that power must be an immaterial power, not one embodied in material organisms such as the brain. So I think here, if one wants an argument for the immateriality of the soul, uh, we have it. Now the importance to the, of this to apologetics uh, it was made evident by Peter Kreft in his book, A Handbook of Christian Apologetics. He says that many modern philosophers are suspicious and skeptical of the venerable and common sense notion of things having real essences or natures and of our ability to know them. Aristotelian logic assumes the existence of essences and our ability to know them, for its basic units are terms which express concepts, which express essences. But modern symbolic logic does not assume what philosophers call metaphysical realism, that essences are real but implicitly assumes instead metaphysical nominalism, that essences are only noumena, names, human labels, since its basic units are not terms, but propositions. So here you can see the importance of this issue to Christian apologetics, uh, because it's here that we have to be able to establish that we truly do know essences, can classify things, if of course we're going to be able to know them, as they are in themselves, in the external world, uh, and be able to pass them ultimately on to other people in terms of knowledge. So then we come to the issue of what is man? Uh, since universals are immaterial, 
uh, it would seem to follow that for man to know, he must be a composite or a unity of intellect or soul uh, and matter or body. Since, as we've argued, uh, universals are immaterial, it seems to follow for man to know he must be a composite or a unity of intellect or soul and matter or body. But it's here we come into a very difficult problem, because how are two different substances going to be able to interact with one another? If the soul is immaterial and the body is matter, how are they going to interact with one another connect with one another, and have a causal and effect relationship. While many answers have been offered to the solution of this problem, we need to really go back to our hylomorphic understanding of reality itself. And it's here that we can suggest an answer to this particular problem. But let me give you first the two options that exist. The first one is anthropological dualism or dichotomy. This view from Descartes, which can be attributed first to Plato, says that the soul and the body are separate and parallel entities that really never intersect with one another because they're two different substances. One is material and one is immaterial. The second one is anthropological hylomorphism. This is the soul-body unity, Greek hulo or hulias being matter and morphos uh, being form put together. This is the Aristotle, this is the Aristotelian uh, Thomistic understanding of hylomorphism, which offers, as I'll argue, a better solution uh, to the soul body problem. In fact, you really don't even have a soul body problem until the onset of modern philosophy and Rene Descartes, uh, because before that, hylomorphism, uh, an understanding of reality, uh, offered no problem at all to understand the soul body unity uh, that exists. It's only since the onslaught of a mechanistic and somewhat materialistic worldview with regards to reality that there is this so-called problem that exists. Now, also understand that I've completely, I haven't presented the options with respect to idealism and materialism, that the idealism being that man is a soul without a body and materialism being that man is a body without a soul uh, because the argumentation I've already given has canceled that out. But so we need to look at these two views in detail, uh, the dualistic view and the hylomorphic view. Uh, and so we'll look at Cartesianism. And Cartesianism has been extremely influential. Uh, the Cartesian view, even influential within Christianity, uh, even more so than Aquinas' view today, uh, most in the church today, even the Protestant church, would hold to a Cartesian view uh, with respect to the soul-body relationship. And most people's concepts are that they are two uh, distinct substances that somehow uh, can interact with one another. But again, that's where the problem is. But the Cartesian view says this from Descartes. Thus, simply by knowing that I exist and seeing at the same time that absolutely nothing else belongs to my nature or essence, except that I am a thinking thing, I can infer correctly that my essence consists solely in the fact that I am a thinking thing. It is true that I may have, or to anticipate that I certainly have, a body that is very closely joined to me. But nevertheless, on the one hand, I have a clear and distinct idea of myself insofar as I am simply a thinking, non-extended thing. And on the other hand, I have a distinct idea of a body, insofar as this is simply an extended, non-thinking thing. So here his idea is that he has a body. And of course, you have to understand and remember his starting point. If you're going to start with your mind, then all you're ever going to have after that are just ideas of things. So for him, he is a soul, an idea, that is trapped in a body, and the substances are distinct and different. And so, of course, this lays itself out for severe critique with regards to its philosophical understanding of how these two distinct substances are ever going to be able to interact. And so we can reject the Cartesian view philosophically for at least two reasons. And the two reasons are related. Uh, the first one is that this interaction problem, how does one substance, which is not materially quantifiable, cause and affect another substance that is materially quantifiable? Remember, under the Cartesian view, we have two completely different substances. 
One is materially quantifiable. Uh, it has a height, length, width, depth, a, a certain position in space. The other one is not quantifiable. It's spiritual. It's immaterial. It has no height, no length, no width, no depth, no position in space. Uh, how does one get that which is material or sensory input to the soul if it is not quantifiable in any sense? How can that which is quantifiable communicate that which is not quantifiable? There's also uh, many other sub-problems with respect to this view uh, that we could bring out. Uh, one has to do with the fact that uh, distinct substances cannot be bound together uh, unless uh, something unites them. The problem of them being able to communicate uh, with one another is big enough. Uh, this one seems even bigger. How are we going to get them ever to be together with one another? Of course, we want them uh, to be together, uh, but the only way you can do that is to suppose that there's some third medium that exists, some third medium uh, that is able to unite the soul and the body together uh, must be postulated. But what could this possibly be? Descartes could only come up with a supposed organ that existed that did it. But of course, you have to ask the question whether this organ he's got, what substance is it? And of course, if you answer it's immaterial, then it doesn't seem to be able to unite it together. And of course, if you answer that the organ is material, uh, then how can it unite that which is uh, immaterial? Uh, so this is a sub-problem of the bigger problem with regards to the interaction problem. And there's also other problems that could be identified that we won't go into, such as personal identity uh, with respect to the body and so forth. Uh, this is problematic for uh, it. And this is enough problems for this particular view, and I would say it's enough uh, to actually reject the view in terms of a prolegomena to doing theology. Uh, the the uh, Cartesian view of the soul-body relationship uh, before one does theology should be completely rejected. And you say, well, then what are the options? Most people have a concept that we are dealing with two distinct uh, substances. Uh, the solution to the problem, the only one uh, that's available to us, is this notion of hylomorphic uh, soul-body unity. The central underlying problem of this view is its mechanistic worldview or mechanistic understanding of the world. Uh, it's rejected completely the hylomorphic understanding and replaced it with a comp completely uh, materialistic understanding uh, of the world, and therefore is not able to explain adequately how the immaterial and material can be together. The hylomorphic view of the soul-body unity uh, solves all the problems with Cartesianism uh, and gives us great explanatory power with respect to understanding our world and the various capacities that our soul has. For example, uh, we are two components of one complete substance uh, versus the Cartesian view that says we are two complete substances. This is important to understand because here I introduce the notion of the hylomorphic view of the world uh, to help explain the soul-body unity. We're not dealing with two different substances. We're dealing with one substance that has two components or aspects to it. Uh, this helps to solve the interaction problem between the soul and the body. Because it's really a soul-body unity and needs to be thought of as a soul-body unity. A one complete substance working together. This helps to explain how the mental or the spiritual world can cause and affect things in terms of the physical world. Because again, it's not two substances but it's one substance. This also, as we've looked at, uh, identifies the soul as the substantial form of the human body. This, of course, helps with the issue of the problem of identity. The form-matter relationship uh, enables us to have and to distinguish and recognize that this person is not that person, the same way we recognize that this cat is not that cat, or this dog is not that dog, yet they have the same substantial form or humanness when it comes to human beings. Uh, they share in that humanity or the form 
of humanity, yet they still are able to maintain their individual identities. And of course, the soul influence the, influences the body and vice versa. Anyone that has experienced pain recognizes this. We can hear news uh, of the death of a loved one, and our soul will grieve and produce certain bodily reactions. We'll start to cry as a result of that. So here we have the soul influencing the body. And anyone that has experienced pain uh, of the body realizes that it can definitely affect the soul and produce depression. So here uh, we have clearly an interaction that takes place. But here the explanatory power gets even greater when we introduce the notion of modern neuroscience uh, and its understanding of what is going on uh, in the body itself uh, explained through uh, neuroscience. But here, neuroscience cannot account for certain things, such as intentionality and the abstraction of universals. Uh, this they can't account for, uh, but these are aspects of the soul that's united to the body. And given our soul-body unity, we have such a tightness and such an intimacy in our hylomorphic understanding uh, that we can see how the soul and body work together as a unit. Uh, for example, uh, think of a table that's made out of wood. Uh, the intimacy that exists between the form of tableness and the wood is so tight that you cannot possibly even conceive of them apart. Try to explain the wood of the table being a table apart from the form of tableness. You just can't do it. You can't separate the two. There's such an intimate connection between the two that the form of the table is necessary to explain the wood being a table. You can't separate the two in terms of an explanation. And that's the same thing with the body. There's such a tight, hylomorphic unity that exists between soul and body is I cannot explain to you things with regards to the soul without appealing to things with regards to the body and vice versa. And finally, uh, the philosophical and theological explanatory power are great that I can't even go into. This view solves all of the problems that are raised in the Cartesian view, uh, which make it philosophically objectionable. And I won't be able to go into it here, uh, but as far as prolegomena is concerned, theological prolegomena, I think that we need to adapt the soul-body unity on philosophical grounds. And I'll tell you that it has great explanatory power in terms of things in theology as well as the scriptures. The scriptures reflect this in terms of the Hebrew view of man. And also, it helps us to explain a number of verses of Scripture uh, relevant to uh, the soul-body unity. So how do we move from this uh, to getting to this notion of a text, of how we ultimately know a text. So we've identified uh, the hylomorphic understanding of reality. Uh, we've looked at the intellect and how the intellect can know reality, and we looked at human beings and understood them in terms of a hylomorphic soul-body unity. But how is it, and can it be possible, for us actually to know a text itself? We know objects, but can we know a text? But it's here uh, that, uh, obviously, the importance to this in terms of apologetics and the scriptures being written and the scriptures recording for us a text in sensible reality uh, and it containing a message from God becomes extremely important. But first we hear we need to introduce this notion of different kinds of causes uh, that apply to the creation or the generation of a text. These are the classic uh, notions of causation evident in Aristotle and adapted by Aquinas as well. First of all, the writer is the efficient cause of the meaning of a text. And the writer's purpose is the final cause of its meaning, and the writing is the formal cause of its meaning. And finally, the words are the material cause of the meaning. So if a text is to be produced, it must have this level of causation being relevant to the production of a text. 
So it's an author that has form or meaning that exists in the mind, and this is immaterial or spiritual. Meaning exists in the mind of man, and then man is able to create a text in sensible reality. And the way this is done is man imposes form or meaning upon matter, and the matter is language and creates a text in sensible reality. This created text can then be read by someone, a reader or a hearer of the text, in which the mind of the hearer or the reader is then able to extract the form or the meaning from the text. And this particular view is grounded in our hylomorphic understanding of reality. So we go from form or meaning existing in the mind of man, creating a text in sensible reality that combines the meaning with language, creates the text that then can be transmitted to others in which the meaning or the form can be extracted and come to exist in the form. And just as the form that exists in the mind of the author, or in this case, the meaning we could refer to it as, is immaterial, it exists immaterial in a form-matter relationship uh, in the text itself combined with language, and then that is extracted by the reader, and the form and material comes to exist in the mind of man. So the process of knowing a text is not any different than the process of knowing anything else in reality, because it, again, is the intellect able to extract form from a sensible object or a sensible text in reality of which it comes to exist in the mind of man, and hence the knower and the thing known become a unity. That is, the thing actually comes to exist in the mind of the perceiver. Uh, hence, the thing, that is, words are truly known by the knower as it occurs in reality. Now, this notion of knowing a text or knowing a thing in reality needs to be distinguished from a modern analytical understanding that is referred to as justified true belief. This notion of justified true belief was actually refuted in a famous article by Edmund L. Gettier. His article is Justified True Belief, in which he challenged the modern analytical understanding that what constituted knowledge. I think this is best illustrated in a from Dr. Tom Howe's book, where he says, suppose you are driving in your car and you see a cow in a field. When you arrive at the place where the cow is, you discover that it was in fact not a cow, but was simply a life-size cutout picture of a cow. However, immediately behind this cutout is a real cow in the same field. The question is, did you know there was a cow in the field? One, it was true that a cow was in the field. Remember, there's a cow behind the cutout. And two, you believed that there was a cow in the field. When you saw the cutout, uh, you believed it was a real cow. And three, you were justified in believing that there was a cow in the field. So by the notion, modern, modern analytical understanding of justified true belief, uh, according to their criterion, you would know a cow. But in fact, you did not know that there was a cow in the field, even though it was justified true belief. But of course, this whole view is built again on a mechanistic understanding of knowing in the world and completely ignores the hylomorphic understanding as well as the intellect understanding uh, and the process of the intellect coming or uniting with the thing known in reality. Now, this is extremely important because most of analytic philosophy operates under this assumption. Uh, the consequences uh, are quite a bit for apologetics in adopting uh, this justified true belief or this notion of what constitutes uh, knowledge. And I'll tell you, much of apologetics that is being written on and developed today is really built on this justified true belief. Uh, even though they see problems with it, they don't see any other approach or any other route to take with regards to the notion of what constitutes knowledge. Uh, they've completely rejected or are ignorant of the hylomorphic understanding of reality we've given and the understanding of the intellect that we've laid out here. I've read secondary school textbooks that introduce justified true belief, and I've read college-level textbooks that have 
introduced this notion of justified true belief. Much of Alvin Plantica's uh, approach to uh, apologetics and epistemology, even though he recognizes problems with it, is not able to overcome these problems and therefore rests his entire approach on justified true belief. So the application to apologetics of what we laid out here in terms of a metaphysic epistemology uh, should be quite evident to you. Uh, God exists and is known as by a philosophical demonstration. Such philosophical demonstration is reducible to undeniable first principles. From there, given the religious context and eyewitness of, eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, uh, these were people who knew and saw his resurrection body. That is, they knew and saw his essence and form. They were able to serve as witnesses on which the basis or testimony of these witnesses was able to be imposed in form or meaning upon matter and language and create a text and sensible reality that is reliably transmitted to us. The mind of the reader and hearer is therefore able to extract the meaning from the text concerning this message, this reliable testimony of the witnesses concerning the resurrection. And hence, one is able to make the conclusion, based on various evidences that are also able to be understood and extracted from the text, uh, that Christianity, uh, what is being claimed concerning God and Jesus raising from the dead, is in fact true. And any approach to apologetics that attempts to bypass uh, this or attempts to bypass or suggest uh, some other approach is simply flawed uh, or even wrongheaded in terms of its understanding of what apologetics must do. Some other metaphysic epistemology is being assumed or introduced if there's some other approach with respect to doing Christian apologetics. If our apologetics is geared towards these areas, demonstrating by philosophical argumentation the existence of God, demonstrating by historical reasoning the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and the record of his life in historical, reliable documents, then because reality is the way that it is, our apologetics will be right or correct because everyone's intellect and experience of the world in knowing things is the same.